Five years ago, I became a park ranger. I won't include the location of this event. I don't want anyone seeking out the utter horrors I've seen in that forest. You think that you're prepared for whatever the forest might throw at you. You hear about the strange occurrences from other rangers, the missing persons cases, the unusual animals that are like nothing you've ever seen before. I was arrogant. I just blew off these stories the other more experienced rangers told me as nothing but paranoia or attempts to scare the new guy. But I was wrong. I was so very wrong. I had to tell this event to someone. To warn people of the things that are out there hiding in those deep woods. Just waiting for that bold individual to walk right into their clutches. This is the reason I will never return to that forest and now live in a large city. I avoid the forests that I used to love so much because I'm terrified of what I'll find in them. Or what will find me. Three months into my time as a park ranger, it was the beginning of spring. For the past two weeks, we had been receiving strange reports from park visitors and a few fellow rangers. People had been seeing strange warped-looking animals wandering about the park. The animals sighted often looked thin with patches of missing hair, had completely white eyes, were gaunt and almost skeletal, and the proportions of the animals were said to just seem wrong. As if the animals were just not completely convincing copies of the animals they were supposed to be. Of course, most of us just assumed there was some sort of disease starting to affect animals in the park. There was an older park ranger, who'd started at the park a month before the sighting started, named Briggs who warned us that he'd seen this before. He was worried was insisting we should close up the park. He said that the animals were dangerous and a safety hazard to anyone inside the forest, but he wouldn't say any more than that. He just always looked haunted when he talked about those animals and said the forest wasn't safe anymore. Of course, we just wrote him off as being a kooky paranoid older guy who'd probably had some kind of traumatic wild animal attack experience. We didn't even entertain the possibility that he might be right, and our hubris would be our downfall. I still remember something Briggs said to me one day shortly before he quit working at the park. It always was weird to me that Briggs was so disturbed by these animal reports and looked so haunted when he talked about them. He was a big man in his late seventies, but he could have easily wiped the floor with any youngster who tried to step up to him. He was an ex-Navy SEAL and a tough and real smart son of a gun. I was surprised he was so superstitious and paranoid that we should close up the park when it just seemed like some outbreak of a disease among some of the wildlife. All in all, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. Briggs wouldn't say specifically why he was so insistent on closing up the park. All he would say to me on the subject was, there are things in that forest you couldn't comprehend, boy. Things that'll break a grown man in two like a twig. They're smart, you know. We think we're the apex predator of this world, but we couldn't be more wrong. If you aren't afraid, you're a fool. They're coming out in droves and I don't know why but I don't plan on being here to find out. I've seen the horrors of War Sunny, and what I saw on the battlefield is nothing compared to what I've seen in that forest. Do the wise thing and listen to this old timer before it's too late. I just wrote off what Briggs told me, but now I wish I hadn't. If I could, I would go back and change what I'd done, but it's too late now, and the horrors I saw will stick with me as long as I live. One week after Briggs warned us to close down the park, he quit and left the park behind. He was the smart one. He knew what was coming and didn't want to be around when all hell broke loose. I saw a glimpse of one of those strange animals on one of my patrols within that week, but it just looked like a sick raccoon to me. I thought nothing of it, and it was gone before I could attempt to catch it. But within five weeks of these sightings beginning, things had started to become stranger. We'd had ten reports from park visitors of being attacked by these sickly-looking animals. All of them had told us the same thing. The animals seemed intelligent now, like they were hunting them. They seemed intelligent, and they seemed angry. We were bewildered and unsure of what to make of the situation. We'd been trying to hunt down and put down the sick animals since the report started. We'd decided it was wiser to put down these animals to keep the sickness from spreading but the animals remained elusive. 
The most any of us were able to do was catch occasional glimpses of them. But that all changed one night on the sixth week of the sightings. We'd also had ten missing persons cases brought to our door within the past two weeks. Though we were unsure if this was attached to the sick animal sightings, and were unable to find any traces of the missing people aside from some abandoned belongings and campsites. On a seemingly peaceful summer night, three of us were at the ranger station on the overnight shift. It was myself, Hank a tough hulking man in his early thirties, and Lita a petite girl in her late teens who was interning at the park over the summer. We had increased employee presence in the park due to the strange animal behavior of the past two or so months. It was close to 10 at night when we had a hysterical young blonde woman rushing into the station. She was covered in dirt and scratches, her clothing in tatters. She looked wild, like someone who'd been lost in the forest for weeks. She was sobbing, babbling, and collapsed into the arms of Hank. I started to check her for and treat her injuries as we tried to calm the woman down enough for her to speak clearly. After an hour, we managed to calm her down enough for her to be able to speak in somewhat coherent sentences. She was still hard to understand, but we managed to get the gist of what she had to say. The woman told us that she'd been camping in the park with her four friends. They'd set up camp in the morning and everything had seemed normal, but after the sun set, things started to become strange. They started to hear odd noises coming from the forest and swore that they even heard talking. Though the voices sounded garbled and growled almost like someone who still wasn't completely sure how to form words. They'd started to feel on edge and had decided to leave first thing in the morning, but were too scared to venture out into the forest in the middle of the night with the strange noises they were hearing. She told us that after an hour of hearing the strange noises coming from the forest, a stumbling and almost hairless sickly gaunt coyote with pure white eyes came out of the forest and started venturing into the clearing where they had set up camp. The coyote was making strange noises like it was in pain, and the closer it got the easier it was for them to see that the coyote seemed off. She said that the coyote seemed just a little too long and too tall to be a coyote, like it had been stretched or something. As the coyote got closer, her friend Trace got scared and decided to throw a rock at the coyote to scare it off. Instead of throwing the rock near the coyote, he threw a fist-sized rock at the coyote and hit it square in the head. The rock hit the coyote and it collapsed to the ground. After the rock hit the coyote, the forest seemed to go completely still, almost like time had stopped. The only sounds the five of them could hear were their own terrified breathing and the crackling of the campfire. They thought Trace had killed the coyote. In the eerie silence, they could see that it wasn't breathing. But then the coyote's body jerked. Strange cracking noises could be heard from the coyote's body as it twitched and contorted. Its body changed into an almost humanoid shape as it rose up on two legs. The coyote bared its teeth at the five of them in a sneer and then opened its mouth. They heard the coyote speak two chilling words in a deep, guttural voice, feeding time. These two words seemed to send the forest into chaos as creatures of varying shapes and sizes swarmed from the tree line upon the five campers. Not all of the animals even seemed to look like animals or like anything the girl had ever seen before. The creatures dragged the five of them through the forest to a cave dragging them inside into what seemed to be a dark and massive cave system. This is something I found strange considering that the only caves we had in this park were relatively small. There should have been nothing in that park like what this girl was describing. She told us that the animals dragged them into this cave system and trapped them in some kind of sticky, wispy substance that seemed almost like spider webs, but with the strength of thick rope. She said she could barely remember what happened after that since she couldn't see it all in the pitch black cave. All she could hear was the occasional screams of terror and pain from her friends and the squelching noises of what she knew was her friends being eaten. She wasn't sure how long she was in there. What she guessed was every few days one of them would be taken and fed upon by what she could only guess was the creatures that took them into the caves. The creatures also would force feed her water and food every so often. Though it was clear from her gaunt and emaciated figure they only fed her enough to keep her alive. 
She said she was fed some kind of mush she was never able to identify. Only that it tasted utterly foul and almost like something rotten. When it was finally her turn to be eaten, she got lucky. She felt the threads that bound her being cut by what seemed to be some large claw or knife, and then she crashed to the cave floor. In a panic, she managed to grab a large rock. She struck out in the darkness towards where she believed to be the thing that had cut her loose. She could tell she made contact with something and heard a growl of pain as the creature hit the ground. She didn't wait to figure out how much damage she'd done. She'd just run. She ran for what felt like hours. She could hear the sounds of growls and what seemed like garbled speech she couldn't understand all around her. But somehow she managed to avoid the creatures who were hunting for her. She managed to escape the cave system and just ran blindly through the forest in the dark until she found the ranger's station. After finishing the story, she just burst into sobs and begged us to protect her from the monsters that she thought were still chasing her. We realized after hearing her story that she was part of a group of five campers who'd gone missing in the forest two weeks earlier. It was a group of college students who'd come to the park on summer break, but after the first day of their camping trip, their families and friends had stopped hearing from them. After three days of no contact from the students, we'd been notified that these campers were to be considered officially missing. We'd been contacted by the families even earlier than that and had run some preliminary searches, but like the five other missing persons that had cropped up in the past two weeks, we'd only found an abandoned campsite and belongings from the campers. After some closer inspection of the girl and some coaxing for her name, we managed to identify her as one of the two missing girls, Abigail. At the time, we believed that Abigail and her friends were likely drugged and attacked by some dangerous individuals in the forest. It was easier to think that Abigail had just crafted this unbelievable narrative as a way to comprehend what happened to her while she was kept heavily drugged and docile. After all, what sane and reasonable person could honestly believe the wild tale Abigail had spun? We left Abigail to eat and discussed amongst the three of us for a bit about what to do with her. We were quick to decide that the best course of action was to notify law enforcement that we'd found Abigail and that there were likely a group of dangerous individuals currently residing in the park. The three of us felt very disconcerted after hearing Abigail's story but knew that we couldn't very well abandon our post in the early hours of our shift. At that point, we all just wanted to get Abigail somewhere safe and really wanted to leave the park, even though we couldn't. First, I tried to call the police through the office phone, but the line was dead. That far out in the middle of nowhere phone service can be notoriously unreliable, so our mobiles couldn't be used to call the police either. The office phones were really our only way to contact the outside world, unless we felt like wandering about until we managed to possibly get a bar of service. With the phone lines down, we just decided to shut down for the night and take Abigail to the police station ourselves. As we were gathering our things and shutting off the lights for the night, we all moved with a mutual sense of urgency. Human instinct is a powerful thing. And at that moment, all of us seemed to sense that something was wrong. Suddenly, Abigail started screaming loud enough that I was sure she could actually crack the windows. She started pointing towards the window straight across from the couch she sat on and screeching, It's here. They're here. You have to help me. They're coming for me. Initially, I thought that the girl was just hysterical. That was until I saw it. The thing was exactly like Abigail had described. It was a too tall bipedal thing with gangly but muscled limbs and a patchy furred body. It had to be at least eight feet tall with the way its torso was the only part initially visible when I looked out the window. Then it crouched down and tapped a clawed hand on the glass. It had the head of a coyote with those milky white eyes. It grinned and let out a growl. Come out. It purred in a gravelly sing-song voice. Abigail screamed and backpedaled away from the window, hiding behind and latching onto Hank, while yelling that we needed to escape and begging us not to let them take her. I was frozen in fear. I was in no way equipped to handle this. I was just an average guy from Iowa with no special skills to speak of besides being decently athletic with an encyclopedic knowledge of the outdoors. 
The only thing I could do at that moment was stand frozen and staring in horror at the thing peering at us through the window and chuckling at our terrified faces. Surprisingly, what snapped me out of my shell shock state was Lita. She was the only one out of us who didn't look scared. Instead, she looked angry. She smacked me across the face hard enough to leave my ears ringing. Then she proceeded to do the same with Hank. Hank and I shared mirrored surprised expressions that Lita was so quick to action and that her small form could hit that hard. Get your shit together. You all need to get the hell out of here. Lita yelled at the three of us. She then proceeded to remove a black pistol from her pastel blue backpack. A multitude of questions were rushing through my mind. At the top of that list was wanting to know what the hell that thing outside was and right below that was bewilderment at Lita's 180 shift from a bubbly perky teenager to acting like some battle-hardened veteran. I didn't have much time to spend on these musings however as we heard the window crack. The coyote thing had placed a hard punch to the window that had caused it to fracture. One more good hit would surely shatter it. Then Lita raised her gun and fired. The bullet shattered the window and sent the coyote crashing back to the ground. Hurry, get to Hank's truck and get your guns, Lita yelled. Hank and I already had our shotguns out and ready due to the reports of animal attacks. So we were able to snatch them up quickly as Lita took the lead to head for the front door. Abigail continued to stick close to Hank silently with wide terrified eyes as we moved cautiously for the door. Lita threw open the door and I was shocked at what we were faced with. There were at least 30 of those warped animals we'd heard so much about, and at the head of them was the coyote with a now missing left arm and the shoulder stump looking like it had healed over years ago. The coyote was the only one to be in a bipedal form. The other animals looked warped in various shapes and sizes, some being recognizable animals and others simply looking like horrifying beasts I had never seen before. The only thing they all had in common was those white eyes. The coyote snarled and seemed to focus its attention on Lita. You'll pay for that. It growled out. Lita sneered at the coyote in response. Shove it, you overgrown flea bag. She shot back as she reached into her backpack and produced a flare which she was quick to light and hold out in front of her. The creatures recoiled at the light and the coyote let out a deep, unearthly growl. She hurled the flare into the crowd of animals, and they scattered with unnatural speed back from the flare. Go! Lita yelled, and the four of us made a break for it to the parking lot while we had the opening. Lita took the lead, taking a shot at any of the creatures who tried to leap at us as we ran. Her bullets seemed to have a strange effect on the creatures. The moment they hit black liquid bubbled up from the injuries, and the things would screech in pain as their bodies seemed to start to dissolve into that black liquid. Hank and I took a few shots at the things, but our bullets didn't seem to do much more than knock the creatures back briefly. When we did get to the truck, we all quickly piled in with Hank in the driver's seat, and he gunned it towards the exit to the park right after the engine roared to life. I let out a breath of relief as I thought we were home free. Don't start relaxing. We're not out of the woods yet. Lita scolded me and then offered a hint of a smirk at the terrible joke she'd made. I looked at her in disbelief for a moment before an uneasy chuckle escaped from Hank and me, appreciating her attempt at calming the three of us at least. Lita's smirk quickly faded as she focused her attention on the blurred view of the forest outside the car as Hank sped along the road. So who the hell are you? Hank asked as he kept his eyes focused on the road. But it was clear the question was meant for Lita. It was an unspoken question that had been hanging in the air ever since Lita jumped into action to deal with that coyote thing back in the ranger station. I'll tell you what, Hank. I'll give you a nice lengthy explanation after we're out of the forest full of things itching to get at us. Sound good? She responded flatly. Hank gave a sigh in response. Fine, fine, fair enough. Do you at least know what those things are? He pressed. Yes. Lita said shortly. Then she sighed heavily. All you need to know is that they're really hard to kill, and that if you want to bring them down, you'd better aim for the vitals. They won't stop moving until their bodies are completely destroyed. Their eyes are sensitive to light, and they'll naturally flee from it. 
Fire also does a nice job of doing heavy damage to them. You manage to engulf one in flames and they'll go up like a bonfire doused in gasoline. But get back quick before they explode unless you want to go smelling like roadkill that won't wear off for weeks. Exception to the flame rule is that coyote thing. Fire will hurt it, but it's not enough to kill it. If something FS up you leave me to deal with the coyote while you all focus on escaping. The coyote gets taken out and the animals will stop attacking. They'll still be those things, but they won't be coordinated anymore. So it'll give you all the opening you need to get out. She explained. I stared at Lita with wide eyes, wondering how exactly it was she knew all this. I could tell Hank was wondering the same thing. But it was clear this was all Lita was willing to tell us at the moment. Abigail remained quiet in the back seat with me. She was just staring out the window with wide vacant eyes. Not that I could blame her after all she'd been through. I guess she just needed time to process everything. Before I could speak up and ask Abigail anything I heard a loud metallic crunch, and then we were airborne. I caught a flash of brown fur before the truck tumbled off the road, rolled down a steep hill, and came to a rest on its roof, having been stopped by a large pine tree. I sat suspended in the air by my seatbelt with my ears ringing and my body trying to process the shock of the crash. I was snapped out of my dazed state by Lita cursing loudly. Shit! The truck is messed! She huffed out as she unclicked her seatbelt and crashed to the roof of the car. Is everybody okay? She asked as she shifted to look at the rest of us. Lita had a deep cut on her right cheek and forearm with some various cuts and bruises scattered across her form as well, but she seemed mostly unharmed. I'm okay, I think. I choked out before undoing my seatbelt as well and hitting the roof of the car with a pained grunt. Aside from some cuts and being sore as hell, I was fine as far as I could tell. Hank was similarly mostly unharmed aside from a thick bit of glass that had gotten stuck in his left bicep but that was able to be quickly tended to by Lita by taking the glass out and tearing off a bit of his sleeve to tie around the wound. Abigail appeared to have passed out from the crash. She had a few deep gashes on her forearms and some smaller scratches, but otherwise she seemed unharmed. However, she was unconscious, and it was difficult to assess how she really was until she woke up. Something odd I noticed about her that I wish I had paid more attention to was that her blood looked almost black. But I just assumed I was seeing things because of the poor lighting and already being very on edge. Hank and I gently removed Abigail from the wreckage of the truck, while Lita surveyed the damage and tried to figure out exactly where we were. The truck was an absolute wreck. The passenger side had collapsed inward like something heavy had made impact with it, and the resulting roll down the hill and crash into the pine tree had completely totaled the truck. We were lucky the truck was as sturdy as it was, or we would have surely walked away with worse injuries than we had. We'll have to continue on foot from here, Lita said before placing a hand over Abigail's mouth and giving her a hard smack to the cheek to see if she could wake her. Abigail woke with a start, but her resulting scream was muffled by Lita's hand over her mouth. Once Abigail took in her surroundings, Lita tore the sleeves off her own shirt and used the cloth to treat Abigail's wounds on her forearms. Come on, we need to get moving before they catch up with us. She barked. The three of us followed behind Lita with Abigail in between the three of us considering her unarmed and mostly unresponsive state. We all moved at a brisk walking pace, sticking to the shadows of the tree line but never completely leaving the view of the road just in case a car happened to come by. For a while, we were able to continue on without interruption. The forest was almost completely quiet, not even a sound from an insect could be heard. The only sounds we could hear were the occasional howl or growl in the distance, and the sounds of our footsteps and heavy breaths. Despite the terrors of the night, this was perhaps one of the most terrifying parts to me. That utter quiet and the sense that at any moment one of those things could rush from the forest to do who knows what. Then the silence was broken as a thing that resembled a large deformed porcupine the size of a wolf rushed at us from the underbrush. Lita fired off a bullet into the creature's chest before it could make contact, 
and it screeched and quickly started to dissolve as it writhed on the ground. Then the sounds of more growls and rushing footsteps could be heard as reinforcements rushed towards the area, attracted by the gunshot and the screeches of pain from the porcupine-like creature. Run, Lita yelled before breaking off into a sprint. The three of us quickly followed with Abigail pulling ahead of Hank and myself despite her frail condition. She had enough sense to at least not run out ahead of Lita, but her swift movements were startling. At the time I chalked it up to adrenaline. We ran with the sounds of those creatures pursuing us filling the forest around us. Lita, Hank, and I fired off the occasional shot when one of the things tried to jump at us from the forest, but we managed to keep ahead of the creatures. Or that's what we thought anyway. As we emerged out into a large clearing, the moonlight illuminated the coyote who seemed to be even larger than the last time we'd seen it, though its left arm was still missing. Behind it stood a large half-circle of those creatures of numbers of at least fifty who all stood waiting, hissing and snarling as if they desired nothing but to charge and tear us apart. Lita didn't hesitate to raise her gun and take a shot at the coyote, but when she did all that sounded was an empty click. She was out of bullets. Shit. She said softly under her breath, quickly reaching to the side pocket of her backpack as if reaching for more ammo. Before she could reach the side pocket, a squirrel-like thing the size of a large dog came crashing down from the tree above and smacked into her back. Lita cursed as she struggled against the creature, but it held firm. Hank raised his shotgun to try and shoot the squirrel creature off of Lita, but as he made that move, he was knocked to the ground by the small, frail form of Abigail. She had landed a hard elbow to his ribs that caused a loud crunch. Hank groaned in pain as he instinctively curled into himself and Abigail took that opportunity to pin him to the ground on his stomach with a two-wide grin settling on her features that showed sharp teeth. Her eyes were white now like all those other things. As she held him, her body started twisting and crunching as her limbs grew longer and distorted with her skin taking on a papery white shade with a gray tinge. She bit into the side of Hank's neck, and he let out a pained gurgle sound as she took a chunk out of the side of his neck. F it, Hank, Lita yelled as she struggled still against her captor. Then she looked at me with an intense gaze. Get out of here, she roared with a tinge of desperation in her voice. In that moment, my survival instincts took over and I listened. It was as if my body went on autopilot while my mind raced. I thought that I couldn't just leave Lita and Hank behind. I had to stay and try to save them. But even as I thought this, I kept running like my body had a will of its own separate from my mind. I tore through the forest, everything fading into a blur as I just focused on what was ahead of me. I don't know how long I ran for but eventually I felt something heavy crash into me. I hit the ground roughly and felt the wind get knocked out of me. I briefly saw the shadowed outline of a hulking figure before I fell unconscious from the hard impact. I did have to split this into two parts because what I wrote was too long to put into one. I couldn't bear to cut away anything. This is all important. You all need to know what happened. Part 2 Unfortunately, I was cut short in my post yesterday, but I'm happy to be able to relay the rest of this to all of you before I get out on the road. When I woke up, everything was still dark. I wondered if I was even still alive. All I knew was that it was dark and I couldn't move. Then I heard a groan from nearby. Ah, shit. I heard Lita's voice say softly before I heard a slight rustling like someone was struggling. Lita... I croaked out in question and I heard a gasp from nearby. Thank goodness you're still alive. She breathed. Then she let out a more frustrated sound. But that means they caught you. Look, I have a plan to get us out of here, but you need to do exactly what I say if you want to survive this. She said in a hushed tone. What about Hank? I whispered back and Lita was quiet for a long moment before she spoke up again. Hank's beyond saving now. You, you don't want to know. Trust me. She said with a pained whisper. Now stop talking. You don't want them knowing you're awake. And whatever you do, don't let them feed you anything. She said with a renewally steeled tone. I did as I was told and shut up after that. 
I don't know how long we stayed in that darkness. I could feel myself suspended in the air and completely unable to move. It felt like I was wrapped up in some kind of cocoon made of a sticky substance similar to that of a spider's web. It was exactly the same conditions that Abigail had described in her story. The only sounds I heard all that time were an occasional shuffling, which I assumed to be Lita, and the distant sound of footsteps and soft growls. After what could have been hours or even days of just staying silent in that oppressive darkness, I heard a ripping noise, and then a loud thunk and a grunt. I wanted to speak, but remembered Lita's words and forced myself to remain quiet. I just waited and hoped that that was the sound of Lita escaping. I heard footsteps approaching me and held my breath while attempting to press myself back against the stone wall behind me on a deep-rooted instinct to cringe away from the unknown thing that approached. Then I heard a ripping noise shortly before my bindings gave way and I went crashing unceremoniously to the rock floor below. While I lay there with the wind knocked out of me, Leader ripped the sticky bindings away from me and I quickly scrambled to my feet. You're going to have to trust me. Stay close to me and I'll get you out of here. Lita whispered in my ear. I nodded before realizing she couldn't see me in the pitch darkness and instead whispered back. Okay. It was all I could think to say at that moment. I heard a strange crunching noise and then Lita grabbed my hand and started to swiftly lead me along as if she was able to see where she was going. I noticed that her nails felt sharper than before as she held tight to my hand. I felt fear bubble up as I wondered if she was becoming something like what Abigail had turned into. But I forced myself to bury that fear. Right then, Lita was my only chance of making it out of that place. I had to trust her. I didn't have any other option. We moved through the darkness for what seemed like forever. We seemed to be moving through some sort of massive tunnel or cave network like the one from Abigail's story. We would mostly move with hurried steps, but on various occasions Lita would stop me and pull me into little crevices or side tunnels when the sounds of footsteps neared us. Then after the footsteps faded we would continue on our way again. I began to wonder if we would just be wandering this cave network until we finally just collapsed. I could already feel the hunger, dehydration, and exhaustion gnawing at me. But I kept pace with Lita, forcing myself to keep walking even when it felt like my legs were turning to stone. Then I finally saw a beautiful sight. There was light streaming into the stony area about 15 feet ahead of us after we'd turned a corner. As we drew closer to the light, I could see that it was moonlight streaming into a large hole of some sort that looked to have been dug by massive claws. The hole was roughly five feet above us and led into some kind of tunnel to the surface. I felt my heart sink as I realized there was no way we could reach the hole to escape through it. We would have to continue on back into the darkness. I'll boost you up to the edge of the hole. Do you think you can pull yourself out? Lita spoke up as I let myself fall into a crestfallen state. I looked at Lita's petite five-foot form in bewilderment. I felt my eyes widen as I was finally able to take in her appearance. Lita's form had changed. She had grown more muscled and she looked practically feral. Her short black hair was wild and she was covered in dirt. But she looked uninjured despite her dirty appearance and very torn blood-stained clothing. Her nails had turned to claws and when she spoke I could see her teeth had changed to sharpen points. When I finally met her eyes they were no longer that piercing hazel green they had been. Now her pupils had changed to slits and her eyes were a glowing gold shade. I instinctively took a few steps back from her as I took in her inhuman features, and she firmly grabbed my wrist. Now isn't the time. I told you, if you want to make it out of this, you're going to have to trust me. She said firmly. I slowly nodded, and she released me in return. Then she laced her fingers together and placed her palms upward to allow me to step on them, so she could lift me to the hole. I complied, and she lifted me with surprising ease. I dug my fingers into the dirt and scrabbled my way up through the hole and out into the forest above. I collapsed onto the ground on my back, taking in deep lungfuls of air for a moment, and let out a short laugh of relief to be away from that horrid darkness. Then I remembered Lita. 
I looked down through the hole that appeared to be an animal burrow hidden beneath a large, thick bush from the outside. Lita looked up at me with glowing golden orbs before she jumped upwards and dug her clawed hands into the dirt. I grabbed her hands and helped pull her out of the hole, though I'm not entirely sure she needed my help at all. Once we were both out in the forest, Lita held a hand up when she saw me about to speak. No questions. Not until we're out of here. Don't talk. Just follow and do what I say. That's how you're going to make it to see the sunrise. She said in a voice that left no room for argument. I just nodded in response to show her I understood. She nodded back, and then we were off. The forest was still as strangely quiet as it was when we were captured, and I wondered if it was even the same night anymore. I had no idea how many days had passed since we had taken down into the cave network. We could have been down in that cave system for days for all I knew. We just walked in silence as the moon moved across the sky. I didn't ask where we were going. All I knew to do at that point was follow Lita and hope that she had a plan. Lita seemed to tense some as we walked, but she said nothing beyond making a circular upward motion with her hand that I took to mean as be on your guard. You're quite the clever little girl. Such a shame that you chose the wrong side of this war. A deep rumbling voice spoke that seemed to echo around us. Lita let out a soft growl in response. Yeah, if you're so upset about it, then why not come and handle me yourself? Unless you're too scared to face me directly. You seem chicken shit with the way you're having all your lackeys do the fighting for you. She barked back which earned cold laughter from the voice which I assumed to belong to the coyote since it was the only one of the creatures I had heard actually speak up to that point. Then a dark shape seemed to emerge from a nearby oak tree that quickly shifted and took the form of that coyote I was beginning to grow familiar with seeing. It was grinning at us with its head cocked to the side ever so slightly as if it were amused. As you wish. He said before he rushed at us with alarming speed. Lita was backhanded hard enough that she went flying through a number of trees which crashed to the ground as Lita skidded to a stop on all fours roughly thirty feet away. The deep gouges in her forearms she'd gotten from the coyote's claws were already healing as she charged at the coyote. The coyote let out a roar that was mixed with laughter as Lita charged at it, as if it were relishing the challenge that had been presented to it. The ensuing fight was one I only caught glimpses of as I attempted to distance myself from the two. I saw glimpses of Lita savagely tearing into the coyote and drawing in Kai black blood from the thing with each hit. She was superhumanly strong with the way she was able to send the coyote flying. It had grown to be at least twice her size by that point with a far more muscled figure than its previously gaunt form. The fight between the two seemed as if it would never end as they destroyed the forest around them. Every time the two dealt injuries to the other, they would heal almost as fast as they were given. Trees fell around the two and slowly their battle zone was changed more into a clearing filled with jagged stumps and fallen trees. Despite Lita's strength, she still seemed out of her league against the coyote. As fast as she was able to heal, the coyote still dealt more damage than Lita and seemed to land attacks on her far more often than she did to it. And yet she never seemed to tire or give up. She just looked at the coyote with this deep-seated rage as she stubbornly continued to battle it. I stayed hidden behind a large rock on a small cliff near their battlefield. I should have run, but I just couldn't as I watched in horror, and yet almost wonder, as the two superhuman entities clashed. I just silently hoped their fight would not come near to me as I knew I would only get in the way or get hurt in this battle between two things who were far beyond the strength of a normal person like me. I could already see Lita was facing a challenge against the coyote with it, only having one arm, and I wondered just how dangerous would this thing be without that handicap. Then I quickly pushed that thought away as I felt panic overtaking me at that idea. Whatever the hell this thing was, it was a monster of overwhelming strength that I could still barely fathom the existence of. Finally the coyote got the upper hand, if you could even really call the hulking patchy furred thing a coyote anymore. It managed to pin Lita to the ground with its massive clawed hand, holding her down by her throat and upper chest. Lita choked and gagged as she clawed and kicked at the coyote's arm, 
and it just laughed at her struggling, even with her claws tearing chunks from its arm. I felt panic build up in my chest at the sight. I felt as if I had to do something to help Lita, but I had no idea what I could do. If Lita wasn't able to stop that thing, there was no way I stood a chance. But I decided that I couldn't leave Lita to just perish at the hands of this thing. I'd already lost Hank. I couldn't just stand by and lose her too. I picked up a heavy rock from the ground nearby and attempted to stealthily approach the coyote while its attention was focused on Lita. You make such delicious prey, little girl. Such a shame that you didn't last longer. It has been so long since I've been provided such a challenge. My compliments. Even your mother wasn't quite so strong as you. But alas, you'll suffer the same fate as she did. The coyote hummed with glee while Lita glared up at it with seething hatred in her expression. I'll kill you, she snarled back in a choked gasping voice as she more viciously attempted to struggle loose from the grip of the thing. Ah, still so spirited. I'm sure that fire in you will only make you an even more delectable morsel. The coyote chuckled, simply seeming amused by Lita's fury. The coyote opened its jaws wide as its face split into four even pieces and opened like horrific flower petals to reveal a large black maw lined with white needle-sharp teeth and out from its throat flickered a deep red tongue reminiscent of a massive octopus tentacle lined with suckers that had silver spikes at the centers. I rushed forwards to hurl the rock right at the head of the creature and hopefully distract it long enough to let Lita get loose. The thing closed in as if aiming to bite into Lita with its monstrous mouth. I felt a sinking in my chest. I was too late. Even with Lita's astounding healing abilities, there was no way she could survive her head being bitten off. But then the thing's chest exploded in black gore as a loud bang sounded throughout the forest. Its body was soon torn apart by more explosions as more loud bangs filled the forest. Lita bolted to her feet as the creature's body started to dissolve into that black liquid I had seen the other things dissolve into. Its head flopped to the ground and changed back to the more coyote-like shape. Somehow it spoke even with its head, now being the only solid piece of it left. This isn't over. It hissed out. You haven't seen the last of me. We will have our victory. It gasped. Then its head exploded in another burst of gore, and all that was left of the beast was puddles of black goo that quickly dried and floated up into the air in little black flecks, as the sky started to change with the first shades of dawn. I felt the rock drop from my hands as a familiar voice spoke from the edge of the tree line. You sure made quite a mess here, huh? I turned and couldn't believe my eyes. Their brig stood with a shotgun in hand and a proud grin present on his face. Lita gave Briggs a withering look in response. Took you long enough, Grandpa. Those reinforcements you promised were almost too late. We lost some good people while you jackasses sat around with your thumbs up your asses. She scolded the older man. I felt my mind begin to swim as I tried to process all the events that had transpired over the course of the terrifying affair. As I tried to take in the scene in front of me of the heated back and forth between Lita and Briggs, all their voices sounded like to me were faraway echoes. Blackness started to form at the edges of my vision. And then I fell unconscious. When I woke up, I was in a hospital in the nearest city to the state park. I was told I'd been transported to the hospital from a clinic in the nearby town to the state park. According to the hospital staff, I had been brought in with deep gashes, dehydrated and emaciated. I'd apparently woken up and spoken deliriously of monstrous animals attacking, so it was assumed I'd been attacked by either a bear or wildcat, based on my injuries, and had become lost in the forest for days before eventually being discovered by two hikers. At first, I attempted to argue and recount what really happened but I quickly figured out that the hospital staff just assumed I was still delirious. They weren't going to believe me. I did discover that it had been a week and a half since the night that those things first attacked. After I was discharged from the hospital, I immediately quit my job at the state park. My supervisors didn't ask any questions. I saw that a missing persons report had been filed for Hank, but no law enforcement ever questioned me about what happened at the state park. 
In fact, there was never any reports at all of what happened in the park that night. And after that night, the strange animal sightings in the park just fizzled off soon after. I thought about going to the police and telling them my story about what happened, but I knew that they would just ignore what I said. After all, who would believe such a strange story? I hadn't believed Abigail at first. Surely no one would believe me either. Since then I've moved across the country to a large city in an arid climate full of flatlands and desert. I want to be far away from any forest. I know that the media and law enforcement won't believe my story, but I recently heard about this subreddit from my girlfriend. She's the only one I've told this story to since then. She's the only one who believes me. She encouraged that I post this here. I think she hopes it will be therapeutic for me. But I decided to post this story because I want to warn anyone who will listen. Watch out for the forests. There are things out in those deep woods far beyond human comprehension. Whatever I saw in that forest, I have no doubt there's more out there. I remember what it said to Lita. It mentioned a war. It said it would come back. The people that go missing out in the forests, the strange things that happen, maybe there really isn't a logical explanation for all of it. So if you start to see animals that look wrong with those white eyes in a forest, get out while you still have the chance, or they might just come for you next. I hope that my tale will serve as a warning to all of you who choose to listen to it. I haven't seen Lita or Briggs since that night, and I can only hope they're doing well wherever they are. While I still wonder what those things are that attacked that night, I'm too scared to really go looking for the answers I want. As far as I'm concerned, I hope I never have to step into another forest again. But another part of me has started to become less scared over the years. I feel angry for all the horrors those things brought on. They killed innocent and good people like those college kids and Hank. I want to know what they are, and I want to stop them. There's a state park a few hundred miles from me, and I've seen increasing reports of animal attacks and missing persons there lately. Maybe I should go there and warn them before things go too far. Edit. I sat on the story I wrote for a week. I wasn't sure whether to post it or not after giving it more thought. Yesterday, I got a visit from someone I never thought I'd see again. I heard a knock on my apartment door and before me stood Lita. She didn't look like she'd aged a day since the last time I saw her. She looked like how she had when I first met her. Tanned caramel skin, piercing hazel green eyes, a petite figure, five foot nothing, and jet black hair. The only difference was that her hair had grown down to her waist and was tied back in a messy braid. She looked up at me with that intense expression of hers before offering me an amused smile. We need to talk, she said simply. Of course, I let her in. She just waltzed into my apartment like she owned the place and took a seat on my couch. Nice place you've got, a little plain. But you were always kind of a basic guy, huh? She said casually as she surveyed my apartment while I stared at her in disbelief. Then she motioned for me to take a seat in the armchair across from her. In dumbfounded silence, I just did what she said. She's surprisingly good at getting others to follow her commands. That small figure just seems to exude authority when she wants it to. Well, I did promise you I'd explain everything. And I'm finally here to uphold that promise. After I explain, I've got a favor to ask. She said. I just stared at her in response for a long moment before finally just sputtering a stuttered, Okay. Lita laughed. Always so good with words, huh, Jack? she teased. That's my name, by the way. Lita continued on to first tell me that her name isn't actually Lita. Navana is her name. So Lita, now Navana, continued on to explain just what happened in the forest that night, and just who she really is. According to Navana, she comes from a long line of monster hunters. What we encountered in the forest five years ago was a parasitic species that can take over organic creatures that are controlled by one hive mind, which in this case had taken the form of that coyote. They come from another world and showed up on Earth about 200 years ago. They're a species that tries to colonize worlds and consume whatever they get in contact with. But Nabana's group has been able to keep them at bay.
They've taken to calling the species Webbers since they trapped their victims in that spider web-like substance, and the parasite looks somewhat like a spider when removed from the host. And yes, Navana and I agreed the name wasn't the best, but it's what stuck. The Weber is a much larger creature that separates itself into smaller creatures, which will then take over a host. They believe there are multiple Webbers from whatever world it is they come from, but they don't know how many. They also don't actually know how the Webbers get here. Thus far, there are five Webbers who have attempted to invade Earth, and only one of them has made repeat attempts. There have been 15 invasion attempts in the last 200 years. Whether that means they killed the other Webbers when they stopped them, they don't know. They just know this one particular Webber they've taken to calling Va, for big asshole Webber, is the one who keeps coming back. Navana says that her people need to start coming up with better names. The Webbers will take one primary host body on Earth, and then extend their control outwards into other creatures by trapping them and feeding them its black blood so that the body becomes suitable for habitation. Then they will eventually turn into the warped creatures I saw five years ago. I angrily asked Navana why she didn't warn Hank and me about Abigail then, and she just sadly stated that she couldn't alert the Weber that she was on to its game. She thought maybe there was still time to save Abigail since there have been cases where people in the process of becoming hosts have been able to be saved. She regretted what happened to Hank and that she couldn't save him. She explained that night was a train wreck and that she was supposed to have reinforcements come much earlier, but due to extenuating circumstances they hadn't been able to arrive on time. Navana explained that her mother had been killed by the same Weber she fought that night. Then she proceeded to nonchalantly drop that she was able to fight Va so efficiently because she's not human. No, in fact, she's a half-demon. She had to use a spell that suppressed her demonic abilities while she worked at the state park so Ba wouldn't detect her, and the effects of the spell had finally worn off when we were trapped in the cave system. She only laughed at my dumbstruck expression, shrugged, and said that her mom had weird and kind of shitty tastes since her dad had never really been around anyway. She'd been raised mostly by her grandpa, who was in fact Briggs. Surprise surprise, that's not his real name either. So the man who was really named Bristian left weeks earlier to get enough reinforcements to come back and deal with Ball when the science had started showing up that another invasion was coming. But as you all already know, he didn't get back until everything had already gone to shit. If I ever see him again, he and I have some things to talk about. Navana explained to me that not only are there Webbers, demons, and magic. Apparently, there's a good many things that are real. Like vampires, werewolves, angels, fae, and dragons. Among many other things. I'll really need to ask her more about that later. She sped over that whole point as she explained that her organization were people who kept the peace and stopped the bad guys who threatened the balance, as she calls it. Can't say their name, unfortunately. Top secret and all that. She tells me that her group in the organization is looking for new members. They need reinforcements since it's looking like that state park. I've noticed maybe the site of a new invasion. Well, I'll cut to the chase. I said yes. I've got an opportunity to do something against those bastards and do some good. So I'm going to take it. Navin is standing behind me now while I write this. She's very amused by how I describe her. She's also told me to stop treating her like a kid since she's over a hundred years old. That leaves me with a lot more questions I need to ask her later. But I've got a lot I'm still trying to process. So, one step at a time there. Agreeing to join this organization means that I'm leaving everything behind now. I don't like the idea of leaving my girlfriend behind, but I know she wouldn't understand all of this or why I feel I need to help Navana and her people. After I finish writing this, I'll be packing my things and making what preparations I need before I set out with Navana. My parting words to all of you are to be vigilant. There are many strange things in this world that we write off as nothing but fantasy. But what many of us forget is that there are many things we don't know about this world. Better to keep a watchful eye than be caught off guard if you do encounter something hidden from the majority of the world. With that, I thank you all for reading my story, and I hope that you heed its warnings.
What happened in that park to the people like Hank and Abigail was a tragedy. Hopefully I can do something to now save people like them. Best regards and signing off, Jack. Perhaps I'll be making another report here one day to warn you all of more of those strange things that exist in this world, so often unseen by the masses. One night I was alone with my mother in our home. She was doing the dishes when I went outside to put the garbages in the bin. On my way back, I was thinking about various things and something came to my mind that I wanted to tell her. I don't remember what, but it's not important for the story. So I just keep that in mind to avoid to forget it. I can't explain the layout of the house, but basically when I got back into the house, I saw my mother going upstairs. She used the stairs at the end of the corridor. The light was tuned off, but I saw her silhouette and I heard the wooden stairs crackling as all wooden stairs do. So I said to myself, I need to remember what I have to say when she comes back, basically. So I go back in the kitchen, which is just behind the door next to me. When I enter the kitchen, I jump scared. My mother was here. I just took few seconds to process the situation. It was impossible for her to come back in 2S. I went to take the biggest knife we had and told my mother to stay downstairs and to be ready to call the cops because someone was upstairs. Yes, I went upstairs with the knife. Not the most clever decision. So I went upstairs. I took my biggest voice, which is not scary at all, and asked the person to show up and I would let it go. No answer. I am going in all the rooms one by one. I am looking under every beds, into every wardrobes. Nobody. I check all the windows, all closed. Nobody was upstairs and nobody could escape through a window. I never find out who or what I saw. Now I have to say that a lot of weird things happened in this house. Shutters closed by themselves. Weird things happening with the electricity. Plenty of things I can't remember everything. Probably ten years after this event, my mother saw her grandmother at night. She died when I was really young. She woke up and she was there. They discussed for hours. My mother learned things she did not know and she could verify a few days later. She could not have known these things by herself before. She did not told me those things. I also have to say my mother did not believe in supernatural before. I think she does now and I like to think I saw her grandmother that night and she was wandering in the house until she could tell her those things. When I was about five years old or so, I was laying awake at night on my crib in my parents' bedroom. I specifically remember the door being closed in the room so my siblings couldn't have done what was about to happen. Am I laying there I am thinking about a million things and suddenly this great force pushes the bottom of my bed and I am propelled a few inches off my bunk. It had about three times consecutively. My best way of describing it is if someone stuck their palm out and pushed from underneath the bed. I immediately covered myself w the blankets beyond scared. I didn't wake up my parents or cry, for reasons that I have always been curious about. I look at the doorway for a few moments trying to rationalize the moment, hoping it was one of my siblings. The door never opened. I someone fell asleep and the next day when I brushed my teeth, I looked underneath my bed and all there was were some of my shoes and toys. To this day I will always remember the experience vividly, and I'm always curious what was that aggressive force. My family owns a small summer house located outside the city, nestled between a small forest and a river. So not exactly in the middle of nowhere. Many years ago, during one summer, my siblings and I, all teenagers at the time, were staying there alone for an extended period. One morning, as we explored the surroundings, we stumbled upon a very large pile of half-burnt human hair in the designated outdoor bonfire place. The hair was unmistakably human brown and straight, and there was enough of it to stuff a mid-sized pillow. To say that we freaked out would be an understatement. Our teenage minds conjured up wild theories ranging from a serial killer attempting to hide evidence to nefarious occult rituals. The most unsettling part was that the hair wasn't there before we went to sleep the previous night. 
The discovery left us both grossed out and scared. After summoning the courage to call our parents, we learned an odd truth. It turned out that our eccentric aunt had a peculiar habit. She collected her own hair over the years and then burned it. Her rationale was rooted in a profound distrust of others to cut her hair. She firmly believed that if someone else had access to her hair, they could somehow use it against her. Yep, we had good reason to call her weird. Even with this explanation, the thought of her clandestinely visiting in the middle of the night while we kids slept to burn her hair and leave behind this bizarre spectacle remains undeniably creepy. Okay, so I hosted Christmas at my apartment. After my family left for Christmas, I stayed up and cleaned while my mom went to bed. I have a screwed up sleeping schedule. I've been staying up until 4 a.m. so I figured to get tired, I should just clean the kitchen, dishes and living room. As I was done cleaning the kitchen, I looked at the reflection of my sliding glass door and there was a shadow figure of a man in front of my Christmas tree looking directly at me. I looked away and started telling myself I was just seeing things because I'm tired and smoked weed, so I must have thought something in the living room resembled a young man's figure. I went to the living room to start cleaning up, and I felt this weird energy. I was uncomfortable and felt like someone was watching me. I quickly grabbed my gifts, and before I went into my room I looked again at the sliding door, and I swear to God I saw the shadow of the young man, but this time looking at me from his side. I screamed and ran inside. Now, what the hell do I do? Am I just crazy or making this up in my head? How do I get him to leave? He's scaring the shit out of me, whoever he is. Also, I have three cats, and one of my cats was staring at the direction the man was looking at me. Now they're all currently in my room and don't want to go outside my room. The same cat that was looking at him also begged to come inside my room by meowing loudly. Help. I'm scared. Lol. I, 34 female, was hanging out downstairs while my child, 5 male years, not months, slept upstairs in bed just like every night. I have a camera baby monitor that is closed circuit, does not even connect to the internet. Basically only a camera and a handheld screen, doesn't hook up to a cell or anything. Anyway, last night I was sitting on the couch watching TV when I noticed my kiddo moving around. So I started watching the monitor to see if I needed to run up and lay with him before he fully awoke. Then it looked as if he was lifted an inch or so and tossed. So then I really watched the monitor thinking I didn't see what I thought I saw. Then it was like he got scooted up. Then it was like something had him by his upper arms and pulling him up into a sitting position with his head back like when you are trying to move someone that's sleeping and they are limp. I immediately ran upstairs and flipped the light on to find him sound asleep between the pillows covered in sweat. I called my husband in a panic because I was very freaked out, and he told me that I probably didn't see it right or was imagining things and to not let it bother me. I could not get my heart rate and breathing to calm after about 10 minutes of sitting in the bed next to my sleeping kid. So I ended up scooping him up and brining him downstairs to sleep on the couch because I sure as hell wasn't going to sleep up there, and neither was he. My husband said it was stupid for me to do that, but I was very uncomfortable being upstairs. My son slept through everything from being scooped up, carried downstairs and being placed on the bed, as well as me staying up for several more hours watching TV, not being able to sleep and woke up when I got up for work this morning at 5 a.m. I don't even know what answers I am looking for, I'm freaked out and terrified of what I saw. Today I had another scary experience. It was around 4.23 am. I woke up from my sleep and felt thirsty so I drank some orange juice next to me and planned to go back to sleep. After a couple minutes of quietness I felt sleepy and closed my eyes until I heard knocking on my window. Which scared me. I felt fear when I heard it because my window is next to me. It's above me by seven inches. 
This was the second time I heard it since a month or two ago. I remember it so well because I was up watching some cartoons around 2 a.m. when I heard knocking coming my window. And I didn't bother looking outside since there is some curtains blocking the view. I told a friend about this today and they said it was probably some branches or an animal. But I told them I sleep in the second floor of the house and there is a screen window frame outside the window. Which is impossible for something to knock from the outside without removing the window screen. Does anyone have any experience with something or have any ideas on what it could be? A year ago, the crone-like spirit of an old woman haunted me. A medium explained that this spirit was my teacher in a past life and that she'd return to guide me in divination and intuition. My attempts to establish a safe relationship with this spirit were not respected so I asked a shaman friend for help in clearing this entity from my house. The night before my friend came over, I was so nauseous I could barely sleep. That entire day, I collected things for the ritual. I had 13 red and 13 white carnations, Florida water, the bell and candles from my own altar and sage. I felt prepared, if uncertain. When I did sleep that night, my dreams were dark and disturbing. My husband, the cat, and the dog all seemed on edge. That morning, my friend arrived shortly after my husband left for work. Opening all the window and the doors, we began setting up the space by lighting candles and smudging every corner of the apartment. The sage burst and crackled, shedding sparks among thick, fragrant smoke. I lost two good duvet covers that day. Both pets retreated immediately beneath their respective beds and stayed hidden for the duration. Preparing to call the cardinal corners, my friend used his phone's compass to confirm the directions. It was way off. I know my house and my corners, and so oriented us correctly. But I felt suspicious, like maybe the entity herself was sabotaging our efforts to remove her. Finally, we began. My friend, beating a low, steady rhythm on his animal skin drum, invoked the guidance and protection of the spirit animals, of the earth and the sky. I followed behind him, ringing the altar bell as he spit sprayed mouthfuls of spirit water throughout the apartment. Throughout this, two things rolled around in the back of my mind. The first, what will the neighbors think? The second was that I might vomit. The nausea I'd felt since the night before had increased past the point of simple discomfort. Next, my friend took the red carnations in batches, dipping them into a bowl of spirit water, then circling them in mid-air just like we'd done while smudging. He went room by room, discarding the used flowers onto the newsprint we'd placed on the coffee table at the center of the apartment. Halfway through his work, he paused and suddenly rushed into the bathroom, becoming violently ill. In that exact moment, I lost the battle with my own nausea. Thank goodness for close friends and multiple bathrooms. Eventually, he'd used all of the carnations throughout the entire space, Perched on our couch, he ended the ceremony with frantic drumming and full voice singing. I could physically feel the energies in my home shifting around us. I gave one last thought to our neighbors and then joined him. My throat raw from the smoke and being sick, I sang out in my loudest voice to move the energies swirling throughout my home. Finally, the ritual was over. We placed the white carnations in a vase on the coffee table. If the ritual had truly exercised the spirits, he said, the carnations would still be white tomorrow when we woke. I thanked my friend, and he left. At his instruction, I then bundled the red carnations in the newsprint and carried them to the seaside, burying them in the sandy soil near a banyan tree. I was too tired when I got home to notice if anything felt different. I simply stumbled inside and fell straight into bed, briefly mourning the burn holes in my duvet. I slept most of the afternoon and all through the night. The following day, the white carnations were still white. I also wrapped these flowers in newspaper, burying them beneath a different tree in the park. As I covered my parcel with the last handfuls of soil, the nausea I'd felt for days cleared instantly, like gray clouds clearing to reveal blue sky. I suddenly felt fine, also very hungry. I returned to a house that felt peaceful and ordered. I paid careful attention over the next several days, 
trying to suss out whether our banishment had succeeded. The crone was, and nearly a year later still is gone. Phew. I know that was a lot. I've had many strange and spooky experiences throughout my life. Holler if you'd like to hear more. Thanks for reading, folks. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not. We were completely sober. Slowly but surely the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization or perhaps a hypnosis. It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a gray beard, but most remarkably in the place where his eyes were supposed to be there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out, so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision, or whatever it was, but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to wake up, so I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body, I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state, it was around 12 midnight, but when we woke up it was about 3 a.m., yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day we both separately drew the man we saw we were both illustration students without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name, the Weirman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain, fully a dew, or something supernatural? If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? Yes, this is real, and it happened this morning. I woke up feeling like any other ordinary day. The sun was slowly peeking through the curtains, casting a warm glow in the room. I needed to charge my phone, so I went to unplug my roommate's phone to plug mine in. That's when I saw it a missed call notification on her phone. Curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced at the caller ID below the phone number. Without thinking, I blurted out the name of the caller to my roommate. She chuckled, assuming I was playing a prank, until I handed her the phone. I could see her face change in an instant, her expression filled with disbelief and fear. She stammered, telling me it was her mom who was calling. Her mom, who had tragically passed away in 2006. The phone call had ended a second after she realized who it was. As she tried to gather her thoughts, she decided to call the number back. To our astonishment, an automated voice answered saying, Press 1 for yes and 2 for no. We were both perplexed and terrified. How was it possible that her deceased mother's phone number was calling her? Her mom's number had never been stored in her contacts. It couldn't be a simple glitch. This was far too eerie and unsettling for that. A million questions raced through our minds. Was someone playing a sick joke, or was this something much more sinister? Could someone be stalking her, using her deceased mother's number to torment her? Or was it some inexplicable paranormal occurrence? We sat there, hearts pounding, minds racing. The room seemed to grow colder as we contemplated the inexplicable event. Our thoughts were consumed by the possibilities of what this could mean. Were we in danger? Was her mother trying to send a message from beyond the grave? Neither of us knew what to do next. Fear and confusion engulfed us. We decided to reach out to friends and family to see if they had experienced anything similar or had any insights into this strange phenomenon. No one had answers and each call only added to the sense of unease. Hours passed and we were still no closer to understanding what had happened. It felt like we were caught in a surreal nightmare, unable to wake up. As the day wore on, we tried to distract ourselves, 
but the bizarre event lingered in the back of our minds, haunting us. Finally, as the evening set in, we found some solace in each other's company. Together, we held on to the hope that maybe it was just an inexplicable glitch or a cruel prank. We agreed to keep a close eye on her phone and seek help if anything like this ever happened again. As the night crept in, we sought refuge in the presence of friends and tried to find comfort in the mundane routines of everyday life. Yet deep down, we knew that this strange and unsettling event had forever changed our perception of reality. To this day, we remain haunted by that inexplicable phone call. We may never know the truth behind what happened that morning, but one thing is certain it left an indelible mark on our lives, a chilling reminder that sometimes the boundaries between the living and the beyond are not as clear as we'd like to believe. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I-15F was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow, and the man in the car clearly watching me. And when he fully passed me, I saw him watching me in his rear view mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed down my pace, so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow, but moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left, and when I saw he was gone I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen, but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking, I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the four turn, I looked back and saw the man at the corner I had just turned from, letting me know he circled back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then as I had just barely made the last turn and was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner up the street straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way, and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house, and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I stay in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back I'm out by myself again? What if no one's home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go. But I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me. And I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him. Especially since if he was at the store I was at, he definitely stays somewhere near the neighborhood. Okay, so ever since I was five, I have been sensitive to energies. I see ghosts and speak to dead people and such. But this is crazy because it has happened not one, not two, but three times. The first time it happened, I was five. I remember I had just gotten home from kindergarten and I went to take a nap. During the nap, I remember sitting at a table with my papa by this time in his life. He already had bad heart failure and kidney failure, so he was on dialysis. He told me, don't worry about anything, you will be okay at this time I was newly diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that would to me later having open heart at 10, and now at 16 I'm in heart failure and stage 3 kidney disease. He also told me that he loves me, and that he would watch me forever. I woke up and my mom was crying I found out that my papa's heart had stopped. The next time this happens I'm around 10 years old. I was at my dad's house and I was going to bed. My dream sequence started with me seeing my aunt on a beautiful homestead or ranch. She was dressed in a flowing white dress and she just looked so at peace. Then I see this dark figure come and it takes her away. While she's screaming and getting taken she looks at me and says, I'm gone now. I woke up and I found out she overdosed. The last time this happened was probably four years ago, maybe even earlier. 
I was sleeping at my grandma's house, and I have a dream about her sister, my great aunt. My great aunt had bad dementia. I see her but younger. And literally all she said was, I remember everything again. And I kid you not, the next morning I find out she passed. In my family, a lot of people are Catholic, but a lot of people are also psychic and or mediums. I think I'm an empath because of my sensitivities and a lot more experiences I've had. But I don't know, this is kind of freaky. So to sum it up, I agreed to taking care of this family's dogs for five days, and the dogs have been great. Happy, healthy, normal pups in a somewhat seemingly normal house. I met the lady prior to coming and even came in the house and things seemed normal. First night I got here was fine until about the second day when all of a sudden the AC stopped working. It reached all the way up to 83 degrees where I was staying upstairs so I had to move down to the basement including the animals. Third night we are downstairs in the basement. Prior to going to sleep I left my phone plugged in vertically on the nightstand next to me and had all the dogs in their spots for the evening. I wake up at 4.30 a.m. I can tell by my watch to my phone being unplugged from the wall and phone completely dead. I then think that's strange because Ernst is no way I could do that in my sleep, but whatever. I get up to go use the restroom and I hear something in the bathroom. The shower was turned on and running water was going straight into the drain. With that being said, there was water soaked all over the ground. I had to use six towels to clean it up. Then the next day rolls around and I decided to give one of the dogs a bath in the upstairs shower at this point. The AC guy came out to fix it and said there was nothing he could do until he was able to check the pressure within a few hours he would come back. He never came back and the AC went back to normal when all of a sudden the whole shower rack falls on my head and almost hit the dog. Anyways as the night unfolds I slept fine. But I woke up at 7.30 a.m. to let the dogs out and I go to look at my phone and the charger is bent and stuck inside my charging port. Now I have to use a different one. It's my last night here and I don't really know what to expect now. Maybe I'm just overreacting, but something just doesn't feel right. Is this maybe something paranormal or just paranoia lol? Okay, so I've never posted like this before, so forgive me for any mistakes. But about an hour ago, I headed to a nearby lake, a place I usually go for my therapy sessions because it's usually pretty serene and peaceful. About 90% of the area can be seen from the busy road. However, there are a few blind spots. So I pulled into my usual parking area and immediately got a weird feeling when I saw another car parked kind of hidden under a tree close by. I'm a female in my 20s, so I'm always on high alert. I made sure to keep my eye on the car when getting my stuff together in my car. One second I look up and no one is in the car, and then a couple seconds later I look again, and a man is suddenly sitting in the driver's seat staring at me. It was like he came out of nowhere. At this point I'm pretty wary about going out into the grass by the lake, but I continue to slowly pack up my stuff while continuing to keep an eye on the man in the car. I open my door and the man immediately gets out of his car and stands in front of it, doing a weird stretch and still staring at me. This lake is very close to a very popular amusement park, so it's not uncommon for travelers to stop at the lake to rest. So I try to reason in my mind and decide I'll just sit in the car for my therapy appointment. I still had about 15 minutes before it started to get settled. So I get into my back seat and close and lock the doors, but rolled one window down because it was hot in the car. I open up my laptop and I look over at the man again, and now he's opening up an almost empty bottle of windshield wiper fluid and starts to pour it into his car as he looks up at me. His whole vibe was sketchy and creepy and I was debating on leaving. The man then pulls out his phone, does something on it, then continues to fill his washer fluid. All of a sudden, a white van with no windows rolls up and parks right behind me. No one gets out. I immediately climb over the console into the driver's seat and started to pull away. The van was close to my car, but there was enough room for me to back up and pull out of there. 
A couple seconds after I pull away, the van follows, and the man gets back in his car. I panicked, but was able to pull out onto the road in between two cars, so the van wasn't able to catch up with me. I made sure no one was following me as I drove home. It might have all been a coincidence, but better safe than sorry. I also called the non-emergency line just in case, and they said they would send an officer out there to patrol the area for a bit. Thanks for reading if you did. It was a scary experience, especially as someone who's been essayed. I'd like to hear any feedback or similar stories if anyone has any. So our boys' ages are three and two. A few days ago, about 30 minutes after we had put the boys to bed, I was in our front living room when all of the sudden I heard our oldest son crying out for me. I peeked my head out into the hallway and looked into our other living room real quick to see if my husband was already on it. He wasn't, so I walked down the hallway and went into the boys' bedroom and both of the boys were sound asleep. Weird. I shut the door and walked into the main living room where my husband was and told him what just happened. He just shrugged his shoulders and said he didn't hear anything. The room I was in is closer to their bedroom so I could see how he didn't hear him. Then last night, just after midnight, I lay down to go to bed. I was almost asleep until I heard my youngest son start to cry over the monitor. I waited a few seconds to see if he was just moving around and would fall back asleep, or if it was the real deal. He starts hysterically crying, so I jump up and run down the hallway to their bedroom. The boys are sound asleep. I'm very confused. I go back to bed and fall asleep. Now a little backstory, I am a very heavy sleeper. My husband always had to wake me up when the boys were babies when they would wake up in the middle of the night because I didn't hear them. He always says I could sleep through the world ending and I would never know. So after I fell back asleep, I get woken up at 5 a.m. to my youngest son, hysterically crying again over the monitor. A little side note, both times I look at the monitor, I don't see either of the boys moving. I see them peacefully sleeping, but I hear the saying. I get my sleepy self up, look over at my sleeping husband, thought it strange that he was asleep and didn't wake me up, and sleeplessly walk down to the boys' bedroom. They are both sound asleep, now I feel like I'm losing it. I know what I heard. No TVS were on when any of these occurrences happened. We don't own a radio. And our monitor is one of those dinosaur ones, so it doesn't hook up to Wi-Fi or anything. And the first occurrence with my oldest son, I heard with my own ears when my son was crying, Mommy. I didn't even have the monitor on. I feel like I'm going crazy. Nothing like this has ever happened before. One time I got woken up to something whistling outside our bedroom windows at 3 a.m. a few months ago. It kept moving from one window to the other in a matter of seconds very earring whistling. We have a fenced-in backyard and the one window is in the fenced-in area. Our fence is six feet high, so that scared me even more thinking something was on our roof. I was absolutely terrified and frozen in bed. It finally stopped and I went back to bed. I talked to our next-door neighbor about it that's lived out here his whole life, and he said he's seen and heard things out here that people would think he's insane. We live on a quiet dead-end road with a swamp or heavy woods in our backyard. In 2009, I attended college at the University of Maryland or Eastern Shore. I always felt overwhelmed with studying and assignments and spent most of my time inside. My roommate and I decided to abandon our schoolwork one weekend and have an adventure. We agreed to go to a Sadeg Island. It's a barrier island and a refuge for wildlife. I was most excited to check out the feral ponies I had heard about. There do not seem to be many places where you can see wild horses anymore. So we decided to camp even though it was the off season and chilly. At least there were no crowds. We borrowed a bunch of gear from our hardcore camping friend and headed out. We stopped at the visitor center and the rangers told us where we would be likely to see the horses. They told us to make sure we put away all of our food items whenever we were away from the campsite. We showed them the bear-proof cooler we had borrowed, and they said that was fine. 
We set up our camping spot and went to the recommended trail, and when we were out there we caught sight of horses off in the distance. They told us to stay at least 40 feet away. We were happy to get a distant view of horses across an inlet. However, we were really excited when the herd stormed through the water and toured the area where we were standing. There must have been three different herds while we hiked that morning. We had binoculars to spot them in the distance and were satisfied with our sightings by noon. We had a cookout and relaxed on the beach. I was ready for bed early and got into my sleeping bag after sunset with my book. I must have fallen asleep immediately. The next thing I knew I was woken up by something howling. Now I'm familiar with coyotes and wolves, but this did not sound like that. It was higher and more shrill. It gave me goosebumps all over and I could feel it getting closer. I convinced myself it must be one of the island foxes, so I just fell asleep again. But then this horrible growl woke me up again. It was a low growl, guttural and rumbling. I could hear something rustling outside the tent. It was probably half an hour before the noises stopped and I could sleep again. The next day we decided to take the wildlife loop trail. It was maybe three miles long and gave good views of Martian forest. We spent a long time exploring. By the time we decided to head back to camp, we were both pretty tired and it was almost sunset. We came over the crest of a dunes and could see our tent a ways away. It looked like it was fluttering in the wind more than it should be. I could tell there was some stuff on the ground by the tent and I remember saying how weird that was. As we got closer, we could see that the tent door was hanging unzipped and flapping around. The stuff on the ground was our gear, sleeping bags and clothes. We thought someone robbed us. We knew we hadn't left any food unsecured, and it didn't seem like an animal's work because the zippers were just pulled down like a person would do. Inside the tent, there were muddy prints all over the ground cover and tarp. If I didn't know better, I would have thought they were from a giant dog. Our bags had been opened and all contents had been removed and thrown around. All the food locked inside the cooler was missing and everything was covered in sand and mud. We were totally astonished, and then I noticed that growl I heard the night before. I was instantly terrified. I can't tell you how primal it sounds. My roommate and I rushed out and heard it coming towards us as it came from behind the trees. We both screamed when we saw this huge werewolf-like creature. It was obviously eating something and looked like a six or seven foot tall wolf, but had a man's torso. It had a long snout and sharp fangs, and when it howled it sounded like a human scream. It was facing sideways from us, so I couldn't really see its eyes. However, its back was kind of hunched over, and it had massive shoulders. It never looked at us. It finished what it ate, and then turned away and disappeared into the trees. We were literally shaken from seeing that thing. We knew we had to leave. Ave. We pulled everything out of the tent and shook it off as best we could. We threw everything in the trunk and raced out of there. We stopped at the ranger station, but it was after hours and nobody was around. We didn't know what to do and went home. I called them the next day to describe what we had seen. I have no idea if they took me seriously or if they thought we were just seeing things. I'm a pretty big skeptic of anything supernatural, and I have a firm belief that everything can be explained by science, so I can't recall anything but one incident. It happened about 18 years ago. My wife's parents' house is a ranch house that is carved into the side of a hill. In their basement, they have a nice wood-burning stove and a big old comfy couch and some crocheted comforters that are amazing. It was Thanksgiving, and we had just eaten. I didn't drink back then either. No meds to speak of. Perfectly healthy. It was my wife, her parents, and her two sisters. In classic form, I go downstairs after turkey, dressing and all matters of food. I curl up on the couch and take a nap. The wood burner was on, but closed so no noise the curtains down, there were the light blocking kind, so it was pitch black. Awesome right, I am snuggled up in this blanket, and I slept for an hour and a half toasty. Just fantastic. I wake up. It of course is still pitch black. I stand up and make my move to the light switch. 
As I start walking there, I hear something. When I say hear something that isn't really a good description, it wasn't like in my ears with a direction. You know how you can tell where a sound is coming from. This sound was coming from inside my head, not my ears. And it was loud the voice which was neither man or woman whispered loudly. Haha, 18 years later I am getting chills typing this. Juoen, my name obviously is John. I stood there in the dark, dead still, about five foot from the light switch, not scared, confused. Okay, who the hell is down here? Where did that come from? Who was that? I didn't recognize the voice. I waited for it to repeat. I stood there for a minute with no light on. Nothing happened. So I walked the five foot to the light switch and flipped it on. Click. Looked around the basement. Nothing abnormal. I heard the rumbling of people walking around upstairs and talking lightly through the floor. So I put my pants back on and walked up the stairs. My wife, her parents, and two sisters are sitting at the table. So not even thinking. I said to them, Ha ha ha. Very funny whomever was downstairs. They all looked at me and you could tell the look was totally confused. My family is the jokesters. My wife's family is the serious people. My wife's mom says, John, we were all up here talking. Then it hit me. That voice wasn't them. Then I got serious chills because it didn't make sense. But I was such a skeptic, it couldn't be anything but them up to that point. Then my wife said something about how their cleaning lady had said she heard voices down in her basement a few years back, and the father also said the crazy aunt heard someone down there once. Then there was insane talk about Indian burial grounds and other stuff. I have never experienced that before, and in 18 years haven't again either. Just strange. He'll never figure it out, I am sure. So two stories, both from my dad, who is an avid outdoors man, hunter and fisherman. Early bow season, he went out scouting for whitetail. He walked around from dawn till about midday until he came to a large clearing. Inside of this clearing, he noticed what he claims to be hundreds of 55-gallon steel drums cut in half. So being a curious person, he decided to go look unknowingly stumbling into a large marijuana grow operation. According to him, he was like F this and just left. Second story is in rural Alabama once again hunting in a new area. Came to what looked like meadow with tall grass apparently, he stumbled over what looked to be a cross. When we returned to camp an inquiry was made about this, and apparently it was an old slave graveyard. It's just weird how the ghosts of history can sneak up on us in weird ways. So this time I wasn't intending on going a hike or camping or anything like that. I had gone to a state park near my home to just walk on one of the trails they had. So I'm walking along its broad daylight out, maybe one in the afternoon when I noticed a side path going off the trail. Now if you have some experience hiking, you will know about so-called social trails, which are paths made by people to get to interesting sites and such. Well, I figured this was just a forming social trail and go off on it to check out what people are going to see. I don't walk that long or far, far enough that I can't see the established trail anymore, but not so far I can't tell where I am in comparison to the trail, if that makes sense. Well, I come this clearing and in the middle of it is a tiny graveyard, maybe 10 headstones in all. It was surrounded by a simple wooden fence and had an old rotted wood bench in the front of it. First off all, let me tell you about the feeling I got from this place. It was sad. Just so very, very sad, like you know how in Harry Potter they described the presence of a Dementor being like all the happiness in the world was gone, and you could never feel happiness again. Well, that's what it felt like. I went from being in a fairly good mood to, well, anyways, it was weird. Secondly, the gravestones were old. Some were crumbled and fallen, while others were worn and had plant life grown over them. Naturally, I went over and tried to find dates on the stones. Nine out of ten of the stones' words were worn away, but as luck would have it, the last stone wasn't completely worn. I couldn't read it, 
but as I felt it, I got the person's death date was July 13, 1817. This graveyard was at least almost 200 years old, probably older due to the state of the other markers. After all of these observations, I decided to pay my respects and be on my way. I stayed a little longer seeing I figured these people hadn't had visitors in a while. There was an old bench that I sat on at the front of this graveyard and rested a moment talking to them for my own comfort, I guess. Some time passes and I figure I've bothered the dead's rest long enough so I leave, find my way back to my trail and continue my walk. Suddenly my phone goes off six, seven times in a row and I check, I have seven new messages. My phone was acting like it had been off for the past 10 minutes and suddenly I had reconnected to it again. Weird, but whatever, probably a weird glitch or something. I finish my walk and stop by the visitor's center to buy something from the vending machine and talk to the park rangers there. I have become friends with one of them up there and asked him about the graveyard. He gave me this really confused look and said there isn't any graveyards within the park. I get a serious look and tell him to stop joking, and he just shrugs repeat there were no graveyards within the park. I then explain to him how I had spent a whole ten minutes sitting at this graveyard. He gets this really confused look this time and said I had been up at the trails for three hours, and he thought I had gone on the ten-mile trail. He saw my car driving past earlier. Checking my phone, I was shocked to see it was 4 p.m. I had been at that graveyard for three hours, and it only felt like it was ten minutes. So turns out my ranger friend has been keeping a log book of weird experiences and happenings within the park and asked me to write mine. I did and went home. I don't know what happened, guys. Where was I? I'm a biologist, and I had the incredible opportunity to explore the vast wonders of the Amazon rainforest. It was an expedition like no other, surrounded by the lush greenery, diverse wildlife, and the constant excitement of identifying various species of plants and animals. Each day brought new discoveries, and I felt like a kid in a never-ending playground of scientific mysteries. As I ventured deeper into the bush, I relished in the joy of identifying trees, birds, monkeys, spiders, and so much more. Every find filled me with exhilaration and a sense of purpose. But then, one fateful day, everything changed. I was following a faint trail through the dense undergrowth when I noticed something peculiar moving in the shadows. Curiosity took over, and I moved cautiously closer, my eyes widening in disbelief as I laid eyes on the strangest creature I'd ever encountered. It was like an alien from another world, a surreal manifestation of the Lovecraftian horrors I'd read about in my spare time. This creature defied any classification. It seemed to possess attributes from multiple phyla and species, stitched together in a bizarre and discomforting amalgamation. Its form was utterly incomprehensible, and my brain struggled to process what my eyes were witnessing. It was as if I had stumbled upon a secret of nature that had never been meant for human eyes. The encounter left me speechless, unable to find the right words to describe this unearthly entity. It was beyond any scientific understanding or known taxonomy. I felt a mix of wonder, fear, and reverence for this enigmatic being that seemed to defy the laws of nature. As a biologist, I had dedicated my life to unraveling the mysteries of the natural world. But this encounter had humbled me beyond measure. It was a reminder that no matter how much we know, the universe is bound to be more vast, complex, and unknowable than we can ever comprehend. For days, I found myself haunted by the image of that creature, the indescribable beast that had forever altered my perception of the world. I couldn't help but wonder if I was the only human who had laid eyes upon it, or if someone else in some obscure corner of academia had stumbled upon a similar enigma. As I continued my journey through the Amazon, my heart pounded with both trepidation and excitement. The Lovecraftian horror I had encountered had shaken the foundations of my understanding, but it had also ignited a spark of unyielding curiosity. Despite my inability to grasp its nature, I knew that this encounter had changed me as a biologist, as a person. In the heart of the Amazon, I learned that there will always be mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting for the intrepid souls who dare to explore. 
The discomforting unknown now beckoned me, and I couldn't help but embrace the awe-inspiring grandeur of a world far more vast and inexplicable than I had ever dreamed. My time slip story happened in the summer of 1987. One night, I experienced something that enabled me to see the world through someone else's eyes for no longer than a minute. It scared me senseless at the time, and I have no explanation for the events all those years ago. The backstory is this. My then-girlfriend, we'll call her Helen, lived in a big, former vicarage built around the 1800s, in a small village in Yorkshire, UK, some miles from my hometown. Her father was a wealthy guy who worked for the government. He bought the house for the family to live in a couple of years earlier, and renovated it to bring it back to its former glory. One August weekend Helen had the house to herself. Her brother and parents were somewhere else. She decided to have a small party. I was instructed to bring my buddy Tim along. It seemed that one of her friends had a thing for him and really wanted to meet him. So the party was me and Tim, my girlfriend and three of her mates from university, one of whom was the reason my friend was reluctantly set up to meet. Okay, so the scene has been set. We turn up with a large quantity of beer and attitude. I did my part by bringing Tim along to meet the girl. However, he then got drunk and embarrassed, and failed to fulfill his expected role of sweeping this very pretty, but rather dull young woman off her feet. He wasn't concerned about romance and enjoyed himself in his own way. We were twenty and that night beer and silliness took over. It was a night I will never forget. By midnight, the girls were all in Helen's bedroom doing what girls do when things happen. They were ganging up together and probably having a group anti-men therapy session. At this point, Tim and I were ready to find somewhere to fall into deep sleep. We decided to worry about facing these disappointed women in the morning. I wasn't drunk, but I drunk enough beer and didn't want to drive us home. I suggested we find a bed somewhere in this sprawling, rambling old house. Now imagine a house with maybe 12 rooms upstairs. I knew the door to the bathroom and to Helen's room, but every other door was a mystery. Tim and I walked to the end of a passage and pushed open a door. The room was empty except for two small ancient iron beds squeezed against the wall and a few packing crates. There was no carpet on the floor and no other furniture. It was like a small storeroom, but there were beds and we weren't too fussy. In our sleepy state, we just fell asleep. The next thing I knew, I was sitting up in bed, looking out of the window opposite. The window had five bars, upright bars like an old jail. The sun was streaming into the room and it was blinding me. Outside the window, I could clearly see the branches of a large tree as they moved in what seemed to be a very windy morning. The next thing I realized was that the room was filled with furniture, very old-fashioned furniture. It seemed like a nursery with a rocking horse in the corner, but there was no ceiling electric light. Not sure why I looked up, but I did and remembered there was no light. As I tried to make sense of where I was, I could hear people moving outside the room. I could also hear the distinct sound of china cups and plates chinking as people carried and served food. I tried to get out of my bed, but I was totally paralyzed from the waist down. My legs wouldn't move, and I panicked. I looked to my right, and there was no other bed snoring Tim. I was terrified. A door opened, and a young woman walked into the room. She started speaking to me, but no sound came out of her mouth. She was dressed like a servant from a period movie. There was no kindness or smiles. She came in and spoke to me, no idea what she said, and then left. At this point, I was shaking like a leaf and trying to figure out what to do next. I remember thinking I should check the time. I looked down at my watch and everything went dark. I could hear snoring and my digital watch showed it was 3.10 a.m. Wherever I had been, I was back where I needed to be. I leapt out of bed, felt for the light switch and turned it on. Everything was 1987 again, confirmed by the language from Tim who was woken up by the light. The rest of the night passed without incident. First thing in the morning, I was awoken by the sunlight streaming through the window. This time, there were no bars on the window, no tree limbs bending the shafts of light that streamed into the room. 
It was just an ordinary window. I went downstairs, leaving Tim to sleep. Once the girls had poured me a coffee, I took it outside into the large garden. I needed to see where the tree had gone, the tree that I saw so clearly a few hours before. Helen and her friends followed me outside and I explained what had happened. That I had seen a huge old tree and bars on the window. The tree was gone. No tree stump anywhere near the building. I saw the small window of our room, and then we saw a rather hungover Tim smiling weakly, waving from the same window, who had heard us talking outside in garden. The story might have ended there. I believe that for a short period of maybe 30-45 seconds, I swapped places with a former occupant of that room at a time when there was no electric light, bars on the window, an old tree beyond the window, and a rather unhappy servant whose voice was on mute. After I told Helen everything, she went quiet and said nothing. Have you ever been to my dad's study? I answered that I had not. She said follow me and we walked into a downstairs room where her dad worked and had his den. He collected documents and photographs from the house's history to help him and the architect renovate it to its former glory. She pointed out a set of five old sepia photographs which were framed on the wall. The earliest dated from about 1880 through maybe 10 years judging by the ages of the children of presumably the same family. It shows the resident, the local vicar, sitting in the garden with his wife and family. He was dressed in Victorian dresses, sailor suits and starched collars. There were, I think, eight children and one was in an ancient wheelchair. They were all arranged in front of a huge oak tree, behind which the window of our time slip room clearly had bars. The boy in the wheelchair looked about twelve and was clearly very disabled. He didn't appear in any of the later photos on the wall, so that's my story. People will say, yeah, the guy had been drinking I had but no amount of German beer in Marlboro's, there were no drugs involved, would cause me to experience what I did. The weirdest thing about the whole event was that it felt hyper-real, like everything was turned up on a TV contrast, brightness, color, everything except the volume on the grumpy servant. I will never forget how terrifying the whole thing was to me. I haven't had anything like that happen to me again, nor do I want to repeat it. My experience left me fascinated by the time slip stories that I know you enjoy. However, I had a genuine wish to never again pass through whatever dimensional or time-space curtain exists, and it really does exist. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.